Welcome to the Leveling Up Your Permaculture Practice Virtual Summit. This year, we focused our theme on permaculture business, right livelihood, and regenerative business design. In this presentation, we are featuring Javin Bernakovich and his presentation called Building a Successful Permaculture Business, Tips and Tricks from a Decade of Mentoring New Designers. Javin says, quote, living in a biological world with financial limitations, I have made it my mission to create ecologically sound yet productive landscapes. A skilled practitioner in providing peace of mind, I work collaboratively with homesteaders, organizations, and families creating regenerative landscapes and livelihoods. After completing my first permaculture design certificate, I saw that through integrative systematic landscape design, people could not only become a restorative influence on land, but also change their lives for the better. Every year I work with ecologically minded folks on designing their lives to work with, not against their nature. Farmers, designers, and those sympathetic to the destruction of our life support systems can need counsel and facilitation at times. I'm happy to provide guidance to those in need. That's awesome, Javin. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. Good, uh, good to finally meet you. Yes, likewise. And uh, so, you know, I, it sounds like your presentation, you'll get into some of your life story and how you got there. So we'll leave that question for that. But the one that I love just asking people sort of point blank, because the answers have been so cool, is what impact has permaculture made on your life? Yeah, it's a great question. So my experience of being in and trying to find my place in the world brought me to One United Resource Eco Village, where I had a chance to take part in a natural building uh, internship. And at the end of it, somebody said, hey, do you want to take a permaculture design course? And because I had had an experience with permaculture that wasn't favorable, I had somebody come and stay on my couch in Edmonton, Alberta, and wouldn't leave for two months, and they were really into permaculture. <laughs> somebody basically, they were asking me, you know, do you want to take a course in mooching? And I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so being an Albertan, which for Americans, it's kind of like a one night stand between Texas and Montana. It's like bigger, better buck and lone, lone rugged woodsman, but always looking for that deal. When somebody told me that the design course was half off, I was like, well, I'll, I'll go for a deal. Sure. I'm here anyways. So I'd already spent all this time learning about building with clay, sandstone, straw, timber framing, et cetera. And I'd had a background in construction. So it was basically just swapping out materials and realizing that the market, uh, the demand for such a market was ridiculously small. Yeah. I went into this PDC and the instructor gave the prime directive of permaculture to take responsibility for ourselves and for that of our children. And then gave me the three ethics, which were the original three. So take care of the planet, take care of the people, and then limit consumption, redistribute surplus. And I remember having a moment where I'd been seeking a underlying directive for my life for a long time. I'd looked at different religions. I had read the Quran. I had read the Bible. You know, I'd, I'd gone through these different iterations and really couldn't find a life ethic that fit with me. Mm. And yet here was a beautiful guideline that really was just that. It was a guideline on how to live. It was a guideline on how to be. And so that night when I went to bed, I wrote uh, in my journal, I just said, I'd rather fail at permaculture than succeed at almost anything else. Cool. And so for me, the very first element that permaculture gave me in a positive instead of a negative, because there were some negatives I got originally, <laughs> was it gave me a direction. It gave me an ethic. It gave me the guidelines in which to direct my life efforts, to give purpose to what I was doing, and to do it in such a way that within the ethics, and this is one of the interesting things about permaculture is that it has an ethical base where so many of the others do not agroforestry has no ethical base right um organic certified has no ethical base um biodynamics has an ethical base but <laughs> it also requires you to think of the world as a cosmic repository of energies which not everybody is ready to do right so permaculture for me gave me a direction a conversation it gave me a tribe it gave me a group of people in which I was able to connect with and relate to. I'm I'm on my 68th or 69th PDC this year or wow. this this month. Um, and when I would start teaching PDCs, I would always say, what brought you to this? And what does success look like at the date that it ended, at the time it ended? And I played along and I was always saying, I'm here because permaculture for me has brought me to some of the most interesting, fascinating, dynamically 
enabled and interactive people I've met on the planet. They're not siloed usually. So they're not just one thing. Mm -hmm. And they have a sense of how do we better ourselves? How do we better the world? And that's probably why I'm still in it. It's why it's still a, a tool in my toolbox. I'm a lowercase p permaculturalist. It's a tool in my toolbox. It's not everything. Um, I think that as a tool, it's fantastic. As a deity, it's problematic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we're when we're asking somebody to come and build our home, we're not even getting them to build the home. They build the house and we make the home. And when they come, they come with their tools. And if we get excited that they have a screwdriver, we're like, oh my God, a screwdriverist. That's a problem. And so similarly, if if people are like, oh, Jav, I'm the permaculturalist. It's like, that's a tool in my toolbox, but it's not, it doesn't define me, doesn't define who I am. And when I started, and you read a little bit of this in the bio, there was so much about being Jeff Lawton, being Robin Francis, you know, being these people who came before instead of who are you uniquely, innately, and how can you bring your unique gifts, your unique landscape, if you will? Where are your inflection points? Where does the water, which is the life ethic that creates everything within all of our lives, where does that naturally flow? Where can we harvest that? So similar to like key line design, where we're looking for inflection points or permaculture design, where we're looking for inflection points. I really dived into these two halves, life design and land design. And in land design, it's the same conversation as pretty much everybody, except I worked at, I, I've worked at very large scales and also done e economics on these types of projects. But on the life design, it was really about who are you uniquely? How can we ensure that you're applied well? And then I started working with a lot of my colleagues. I worked with a lot of the people who have names on books because they found out what I did. They called me up. They said, Hey, I'm burning out or, Hey, I don't really know my direction or I'm, I'm questioning the direction that I feel like I've been shoehorned into within the movement. And so I had a, I had all these opportunities to work with my colleagues and, and others to help them either move further into a right livelihood because we change shockingly. <laughs> we change throughout our lives. Entropy is always working on us. We're always evolving. We're always transitioning. And as people are moving into who they're becoming, they can kind of falter because permaculture innately as a land design approach doesn't necessarily have a spiritual, emotional, social component. We've made most of that, most of that since uh, permaculture one. And what I love about the life design is that I, because I have a background in business, I'm also able to help clients, students, and colleagues redefine, improve, or be more specific with their business. And so that's the other thing that permaculture has given me. It's given me a couple of different sandboxes to play in. That's amazing. I love that you do the life design piece because permaculture is ripe for it. People need it. People like ecologies, like you mentioned, change over time and reach stagnant points where we're a little bit like, man, now what, you know, and just to have somebody help you in that design process can move things along so much more fast and so much more successfully. So that's great. But the the question is, Javin, did you learn how to mooch? <laughs> still not something i'm comfortable with yeah me neither man <laughs> still not comfortable yeah I, I think it's that whole thing you know it's like mollison said it and masanobu fukuoka said it before but it's everything gardens like everything takes care of its needs everything adapts and interacts and works with and i think one of the things we've lost within society is the ability to really take ownership of one's needs and to every year try to take a little bit more responsibility be it food water emotional stability you know this this is a bit of your background as i read yep um and and the majority of us don't the majority of us are built and created and encultured to be subservient but also to be within a system where we get to be kids forever no one actually ever gets to grow up or has to grow up yeah. and actually take responsibility for themselves and i think that's where permaculture offers a little bit more than maybe some of the other approaches to call it holistic design or um, inhabiting the planet as if we want to stay. <laughs> yep. Or even self uh, improvement practices. You know, I think permaculture offers something very unique in that space. So with that said, Javin, that's a fantastic answer and a fantastic sort of intro to your presentation. So I'll let you pull up the presentation. I'll remove myself here. I'm on mute if you need anything. Otherwise, go for it. Can we see what we can see and all that we can see? We can see it. Fantastic. So for those of you that are joining us and all of you are joining us in a, a pre-recorded LAN, I'll say this, if you've decided that this is a good presentation for you, take the time to actually be present for the presentation. 
And that isn't to say I'm fantastic and amazing. Um, my dog thinks so, but you know, besides that, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. But more often than not, we are multi-distractors uh, instead of multitaskers. So if you are interested in this, if you are interested in this conversation, uh, really take the time to focus, remove distractions, turn off notifications, close tabs, make the presentation full screen, get comfortable. You don't have to you know, sit at your desk and do this. You don't even have to watch. You could just listen. Take notes, how you take notes. It took me a long time to realize the way I took notes wasn't the way I was forced into in school, shockingly. Be here for you. So whatever reason it is that brought you that uh, this this presentation appealed to you, really keep that in mind and look for whatever that is within the presentation. If you don't find it, law of two feet, move, get up, turn it off. You are not indebted to me to listen to the whole thing. But make sure it's not personal resistance. Make sure it's not the small voice or the loud voice that goes, eh, this is too hard or eh, I'm emotionally upset by what he said. Take the time to be conscientious about why and how you got yourself into this, this moment. So my presentation is called Roots of Success, a Decade of Regenerative Business Mentorship Lessons. And the great thing about my experience is that I started my first PDC in 2009. And because of my background in business, basically the next year, I was helping other people develop their businesses as I was developing my own. So I've had an exceptional career of being able to not only design and work with landscapes up to 65 hundred hectares or backyards, but I've also been able to work with a lot of colleagues and friends and, and individuals, not just on the land design side where I uh, analyze and I design either small or large scale landscapes or develop ponds or survey properties, but also in the life design context where I like listening to people's problems. It's a very weird thing. My colleagues uh, question me many times when I take on another client who's going to tell me all the things that are wrong with them. Or they come to me with, you know, a half a million dollar problem as Dakota Cohen did, or a $50,000 problem as Zach Weiss did, or all of these individuals who said, Hey, I, I see that you have some value in what you do and how you do it. Do you think you could help me process a single decision or develop an entire way of looking at my life? So that way I can make one decision that will make 10,000 decisions, which is values-based decision-making, which we'll talk a little bit about. And that's what I've done. It's It's been a beautiful, wonderful, incredible ride and uh, super fun to do because I've got to work with a lot of colleagues and clients and friends and just it's, I couldn't have asked for a better uh, 15 years in this work. One of my all time favorite approaches to life is to realize that the life that you live, the map uh, that we take off of that is never the territory. And so some models are, are useful, but they're all wrong inherently. They all have some value to how we're looking at life or how we're looking at a landscape. But inherently, the only thing that is the landscape is the landscape and the only thing that is your life is your life or your business. With that said, this process that I'm gonna lay out, the lessons I've shown and, and learned about is, uh, is specific. It's specific to what I've worked with and the 65 different clients I've worked with. So mileage may vary. Uh, like Bruce Lee said, take the best, leave the rest and uh, add something uniquely your own. This approach really works for those that want to be excellent in their field. It's not great for people who are like, ah, I want a side job putting in food plants. My approach and how I've structured this is really about being as good as you can be. And this process is iterative, but linear. So we have steps to go through, but each step doesn't completely fill out. Once you're on step three, you come back to step one. And if you're in permaculture, you realize that spiral iterative processes are kind of where it's at. And besides that, I talk very fast. And so slow or pause the video when you need to. One of the great things about modern technology is you can slow me right down so I sound normal and not like a chipmunk. And for those of you that work way faster than I in your cognitive processing, you can speed me up. Two things that I found have been essential for this work and all the other work and the skills that I, I develop is this idea of an open toolbox and a growth mindset. And we were talking a little bit about that before in terms of an open toolbox. I'm a lowercase p permaculturalist. It's a tool in my toolbox. It's not everything. So I like to have an open, open toolbox and an open mind, but not so open that my tools fall out or my mind falls out. And second, I have a growth mindset. I started training as a firefighter years ago and also a fire lighter which uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about in another presentation about um, wildfire mitigation. And 
what I learned is that when they were teaching, they actually talked about this. They said, you can have an open mindset, a closed mindset, or a growth mindset. Closed, I don't want to learn anything new. I know everything. Open, I'm open to learning new things. Growth, I'm learning and open to having my learnings challenged, the things that I think are truths, to learn even more. And that's a step above an open mindset. That's really saying, I don't know everything, but I'm willing to give up the thing that we value most, being right, to learn something new. The epiphany that started this whole approach of life design, which led to business design, which is now why I'm talking to you, is if you don't design it, someone else will. And this is also a play on that story as uh, nature abhors a vacuum. It will take the genetic seed bank within the earth and it will express itself regardless of what you want if you don't take the opportunity to design what's on top. So similarly, if you don't design your life, it'll be designed for you. If you don't design your business, it'll be designed for you. If you don't design your mindset and your belief system, they'll be designed for you. And I look at this like horse and cart. Horse, horse is the horsepower, the capacity that we all have to pull our hopes and our dreams in the cart. And most everybody in modern society wants your horse to pull their cart. They want you to say, yes, I believe in your dream and your vision, and I will pull your cart to the ends of the earth. And the epiphany here is that if you don't have a stronger dream than somebody else, you'll become subservient to their dream. And so being conscientious about, about that, the way that we have developed our businesses, if we have them, or the way we're thinking about businesses, if they're new to us, is usually from other people. And usually we haven't questioned the beliefs we've heard. And this is where the idea of actively designing or challenging some of those beliefs comes into play. One of the most important equations I've ever been introduced to is this idea of the equation of change. And the equation of change is 100% at one end is the beginning where we haven't changed. On the other end is a complete 100% change. We're a different person, place, business is different. We're in a business. The first 10% is awareness and it's a prerequisite. So we have all of this incredible spotlights that we have that go out into the world and they pay attention to a numerous number of things. They pay attention to our friends, our family, they pay attention to the news, they pay attention to our own inner dialogue sometimes, but very seldomly do we turn that attention back to ourselves and we grow our awareness about a conversation that's growing inside of us. So if we have a business conversation, there may be an idea that we want to develop. We may want to change or transition as a lot of my clients do. They may want to strengthen what they're doing, but unless we're aware of the problems, the pieces, how we're thinking about it, then we're actually not eligible for change. Then we get into the tools and techniques. And so this presentation is very much about tools and techniques. And this equation is a tool and technique, but that's only 40% of the equation. We still have 60% to go, which is execution, feedback, and adaptation. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's where we actually give into the work and we make it happen. One of the turning points in my life was when I realized that if I had a ruthless clarity of vision, if I had a dream so strong, that it was the only thing that I was I was focusing on. It was the only thing that I wanted to make happen. It would happen. And I got this from the former mayor of Victoria, Lisa Helps. And when I realized it in action, it became a North Star, a guiding light, something that I was immovable from. Doesn't mean that I didn't listen to what was going on. Another one of my favorite aphorisms is uh, firm beliefs loosely held. But I was also so clear on what I wanted that I could bring anything, any opportunity, idea, new business approach to me, and I could I could evaluate it for its ability to bring me where I wanted to go. This brings us into this very simple design approach that now for 15 years, I've worked with 65 folks and counting. And it starts off with acknowledge, with awareness, where, where you are and what you have. So we live in a world where there are more excuses and potentials for not doing what we think we should do than there are potential possibilities for actually making it happen. So when we start, we really want to get a sense of, okay, what am I doing? Where am I? What, what could I possibly do? And this leads to us to eligibility. It's one of my favorite words. Are you eligible for the dream that you have for this envisionment of the future? So an eligibility and envisionment go hand in hand. Years ago, I wrote down in this journal, that night, I said I'd rather fail 
uh, at permaculture and the seed and anything else. And I wrote down a list of things I wanted to do. This included having a farming business. This included having a design business. This included living in a sustainable community. This included playing the cello, which if I panned the camera over, I just started a couple of months ago. So that was the envisionment process. How much of that was I eligible for? Very little because I hadn't had the experience of landscape design. I had taken a PDC like a lot of people do, and they think they know more than they do. But once you get onto the real world, you really don't. And there's a lot of skills you have to be conscientious of. Then once you have this envisionment, what is it I want? Clarify the values on the envisionment. What kind of business do you want? How do you want to feel in that business? Do you want clients to joyfully make payments on time? Do you want to be working and pulling yourself into and through your business every day. Those are values in terms of what you want to be true versus the thing itself. And this is a switch. We'll go into this, but this is a switch on what uh, common society wants from you. They want you to be interested in the thing because if you're interested in the thing, you'll stop thinking about the quality of life behind it. Then there's this conversation about inventorying who we are, what we have, and where we want to be, and executing by systematically, consistently, and smilingly enjoying the process of developing skills, because skills are forever. That's the beautiful thing about them. Next, we take a look at the three legs, the three tripod of business. You have your craft, your craftsmanship, your reputation, how people find out about you and your business systems. And any one of those legs can be problematic, and the, the, the little stool topples. Next, we'll talk a little bit about value expert advice and seek it, pay for it, get the best advice you can. It's always worth it. Somebody who's been through the process for 40 years, 15 years, 10 years, they know the quick step, fantastic. Let's pay value for that. Eight, document everything. And then part of that is sharing that. So I, I was lucky at the beginning, I had somebody say this to me, take before and after photos, write about what you do. So now I've got this portfolio of material that I can share. And then as usual, monitor and adapt and work on your business as much as in your business. So there's these design principles that I have that I'm going to show here. You can pause, you can take a look at, you can come back to, uh, including this next screen. I'm going to go quickly through these because there's a lot to cover. One, profit is essential. So many individuals have come to me because they've burnt out or they've prioritized the work of saving the earth as they think they're doing, but not themselves. So there hasn't been enough of themselves or their family in the business and they burn out. Profit is essential. We have to have some profit within it. We also have to be able to clearly and simply communicate the value of what we do to others. We also use, need to be different. We need to differentiate. We need to be in uh, a blue ocean where we are singular within that instead of the multiple. Cultivating in, indifference to the sale is really important. We need to be able to be conscientious as when we're working with somebody or working with a client that they don't feel us being uh, uh, clingy towards a sale. We just have to be indifferent. We have to have that sexy indifference of if this comes great and if it doesn't, great. And that allows the client to really, potential client, to make a decision based upon their aspect. This isn't a pushy sale at all. But we also need to be selective about our clients. Who are they? Who do we want to work with? Are we going to do another deck project um, when we potentially could be open up to doing an edible landscape? This also means having an efficient client process about how they come into our business, how they work with us, what we, what we develop for them, how they access that. I'm a big fan of not discounting, just adding more value. So discounting our services lets people know that we can be discounted. And in that case, our value is not what we think it is. Always innovate. Always be looking at how we can innovate the aspect. This is goes back to, if you're not interested in being the best, this, this process is probably not for you. It also means that being specialized, same thing with differentiation. Uh, great colleague and friend and, 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 and co-instructor of mine, Gord Barrett of Ecosense, has become the water practitioner within Vancouver Island, be it rainwater harvesting or water purification, working with small communities, even medium-sized communities. He specialized so much that, and even though he has so many skills, he's become specialized and now he is the person to work with. Time, assets, investment. So we want to invest in aspects that will save us time and money. So if we can invest things with uh, uh, like a customer relationship management software, or if we can have our entire pitch in terms of what our business is online, people can interview us for free because they can go through our material. We want to stack value in everything we do. And then we want to build and nurture relationships because relationships is the core conversation with everything we do. I'm going to hold this for a second. So that way people can pause and come back and 
and take a look at this. And then remember, a couple of things to remember. So many clients, so many students come to me and say, I don't have any confidence in what I can do. Great. Confidence is the byproduct of competence. And competence is working through a skill and knowing you can do it at repetition with mileage. So when you think about, well, I don't know how to do this, we can go back and actually build competence first. And then confidence comes out of that. You don't go and seek it. Incremental steps to avoid excremental results. You can't be where you need to be until you go into, or you're going to offer problems for people. You're going to big heaping pile of problems for people. So be conscientious to take the steps you need to, to develop the skills. And your business, whatever that idea might be, you may not you may not be vi viable or valid in your area. There's not a lid to every pot. And so if that's the case, if you go out and say, I'm going to make an edible landscape design business and in your, your area, there's 17 already, or in your area, there's no interest in it because the, the populace is in a more conventional mindset, then you have to adapt to that. Maybe you have to work on something more practical that solves a real problem. I wish I had a day job when I started this. Uh, the very second year I got out on my PDC, I started hosting, not teaching. I started hosting PDCs, bringing together this incredible collaboration, multi-instructor group, eight different people who, who taught this PDC. And uh, I had 35 bucks in the bank and I made about 19 cents an hour on that PDC in terms of the time I put into it. I wish I had had a day job. And I say this because I've worked with so many clients now that we transition people out of their day job into what they're doing. And then we usually high grade what they're doing for their day job. So that way, if they do need to, they can go back and make a big paycheck and they can continue to further their dream. And then be conscientious about every single opportunity is either an earning, I can make cash so that I can support my burn rate. Burn rate is how much it costs you to live a month or you and your family, whoever you're responsible for, or I can learn. I've taken... When I started, probably 75% of my jobs, I was learning. Sometimes I was paying somebody else to design or to look over my designs, and it was the full amount of payment I received, only so I could learn. And I still do this today. I still have what's called red team design. 15 years later, I hand the red pen to one or two different designers who I trust, and I say, tell me why I'm wrong. It is the most valuable way to move about it. So be conscientious that every opportunity is to earn or to learn or both. One of the major aspects of my work these days, because I teach for Oregon State University's permaculture design uh, course, the pro version, which helps people get into business right away, is how to take those PDC blues into a post-PDC blueprint. How do we build a simplified format to get you to where you want to go? And the first step is eligible. What are you eligible to do? Post-PDC, when you're teaching, there's always a group of, of people, mostly dudes, who are like, we're going to be food foresters. We're going to food force the world. And you have to ask them, cool. Great. Have you ever run a business? No. Have you ever planted a tree? No. Great. So their enthusiasm is greater than their eligibility, which is fine. But that then helps them to be specific about what skills they have to go and, and, and address and work with. This then allows them to plumb their past and go, well, what have I done before that allows me to plot the future that I'm working upon? Have, have I worked construction? Have I, have I never picked up a tool in my life? In which case, maybe I'm better to partner or guild with an existing company because I have marketing skills or background that can help them. One of the ways I've helped people do this is this idea of zones of brilliance. This was an innovation I had years ago when I was looking at zones in permaculture, the frequency of human initiative and where we place elements in terms of their care. And I thought, well, isn't that true for us as well? Don't we have zones as well? Don't we, aren't we brilliant in certain places? And we're always trying to find that sweet spot in the middle. So first it was this idea of, well, what are our perennial passions? What are the things that come up inside of us over and over, you know, what are the tab browser windows that have so many tabs that you can barely see the title or the icon? What are our inherent gifts? What are the things that we bring to our work or bring to this world natively and naturally? And what are the perceived problems or what are the problems we could uniquely solve? I gave a presentation very much like this in Permaculture Voices One, and a man came up to me at the end of it, who was a mechanic, and he goes, I think you saved my life, which when you're just starting out is a lot to take in. I said, okay, why don't you parse that out for me so I don't freak out anymore? And he said, I think you saved my life. I was a mechanic my entire life. I took a PDC. I was told I should compost. I've been trying to make compost for four years. I'm making terrible compost. I love, I love wrenching. I love being under cars. I love making what I need to make. But what you did is you, you showed me that I could just be a permaculture mechanic. I could focus on where the oil goes. I could focus on keeping materials. I could focus on keeping machines running. I could focus on creating uh, bio 
fuels. You showed me that my inherent gifts and my perennial passions. These are the things that are most important to me. And so this became a process by which I could help people find that sweet spot. And by doing this, I asked them questions like, of the elements that are in front of you, do you enjoy it? Do you have skill in it? And are you more for this? This idea of more, this idea of, is there more than afterwards through this idea of regenerative? It's kind of like when a deer browses on a tree. If they browse a little bit, then the oxen, the hormone within the tree goes down to the crown and says, hey, we're dying, grow more. And so it comes up and there's actually more tree after browsing. So this idea of regenerative. I want to give you a couple of case studies here. So this individual had a passion for permaculture and food, was uh, gifts for organization and motivation like you can't believe. And in this area, there was no good local food access. This was at the end of a PDC. And I used to do this 10, 10, 100 uh, challenge, which is 10 days after the PDC with no more than 10 hours and $100 of your local currency, apply permaculture in some way, shape or form, make a tangible project because so much of permaculture during the education can be theoretical. So this was a, a student there and they asked, well, that's a great challenge, but you know more than us. What would you like, if you were to make a business tomorrow, what would you make? I said, I'd make two things. I'd either make a mushroom growing business for uh, culinary gourmet mushrooms, or I'd made a food aggregator. And that's what Jay did. She went out and she created Farmbound. And it's one of the most profitable farm, uh, farm pardon me, food aggregators I have ever witnessed. Farmbound has become an institution in Vernish, British Columbia, as has Jay, in creating and bringing people together and really working on first and seconds in terms of food. Most people know that there's a seconds in terms of a rating system of that type of food quality. They have their own grocery store now in the back of their warehouse where you can go and buy seconds of organics at or below conventional food prices. As long as you're willing to realize that not all food looks perfect, but it's still perfectly delicious and edible, you can go and grab that. Food aggregators was a brilliant way of getting into her gifts. Next was this person had a passion for meeting soil. They had a gift of writing, interviewing, storytelling, but they had no remediating uh, remediation. There was no remediating resource and they had no experience. So Lila Darwish went out and she created Earth Repair. It was a beautiful book, incredible aspect. We had a great conversation early on in the process. She was talking about how she hated map making. She hated like detailing the site. And I gave her permission not to be a map maker. And she went out and found people to make maps for her and was able to really focus on this to the point to where she is now highly skilled in disaster response and has worked as the disaster response coordinator for both New Orleans and also Vancouver, Canada. This person had an incredible passion for city spaces and permaculture, urban planning, but there was no permaculturalist working at a municipal level. And this was Lindsay Meads. Lindsay came out to a PDC that Ron Barazan was running that I was a co-instructor at down in Cuba, 21 days, we went around the island. Lindsay that featured in the bottom left here was an incredible urban designer, incredible. She spoke the language, she spoke urbanese, she, she spoke uh, all of that aspect. And so she partnered with Adrian to the right to create a brand new company that focused on urban aspect within permaculture. They mostly did uh, school landscapes. It was a great place to be. This individual uh, had a passion for women in agriculture. She loved writing, interviewing, storytelling, but there's no source for women in permaculture stories. This is Trina Moyles. She created this amazing book called Women Who Dig. And again, it established her as a voice within this world about this conversation. This was another student of mine who was an amazing illustrator, but didn't have any experience. He gilded with me. He uh, illustrated most of my designs for a number of years because he found the place to where he could come into that work and really explore it. This longtime friend had this idea that permaculture should be more epic. There was a lack of permaculture business examples. He was, had great curiosity of interviewing and exploring. Of course, Diego Footer, who created Permaculture Voices and then later created Paper Pot Co. and also Farm Small, Farm Smart, the longest running vegetable and farming podcast in the world. This is about being responsive to who you are instead of going out and saying, I'm going to replicate a business that I see. Another client of mine created amazing heirloom hand tools that he could pass down through the ages. Another client of mine, these gents, they created Edible Landscapes Design, now one of the premier edible landscape design companies on Vancouver Island. So this is all to say that you start off with an idea and then it turns into the dream years later. It takes time and effort, but you find where you're going. These folks were amazing. They love fungi. They were detail-oriented. Again, no source of good culinary mushrooms. Gruger family fungi. Fantastic product. Fantastic approach. 
Another uh, former student of mine who, funny enough, I taught at the OUR Eco Village Permaculture Design Course 10 years ago. And this year was back there teaching. He was teaching the same conversation I taught 10 years ago because he applied what he did to what he knew, which was he's a creative. And so he helps artists, musicians, and other creative project makers design balanced, sustainable careers through permaculture. He didn't change. He didn't go and, and, and throw plants in the ground. He said, no, no, I'm already a creative. I love creatives. I want to help them. So again, sometimes enthusiasm does trump eligibility if you stay within that conversation to build what it is you're doing. That then helps you create a ruthless clarity of vision to help you then choose and evaluate the potential action steps that bring you to where you want to be. This is called values-based decision-making. It was based upon holistic management. And basically what we do is we take an inventory of who we are as people. We take a look at our living, our spiritual, social, intellectual material, financial, experiential, and cultural capitals. You may have uh, recognized this from the Regenerative Enter Enterprise book by Ethan Rowland and Gregory Landua. This is an amazing tool to look into. I highly recommend people read the book. Once you have that idea of an inventory, then you can start to capitalize and really understand what are the values and visions. Who do we want to be in the future? How do we want to go about there? And what are the indicators that will bring us there? So this idea of know what you want to know what you have to do and then know how it's true. So I wanted to have a business I never needed to take a vacation from. To do that, I had to make a lot of decisions that didn't make me the donkey that was pulling somebody else's cart. And the way I knew that was true is I liked coming to my desk. That was the indicator. So if you're into equations, if I want X, I need to do Y. And if I do X and Y, I'll know that's happening because of Z. So this is this idea of future indicators. How will we know that this is true? This then allows us to create filtering questions and those questions can then bring us to ask questions like, does this action identify the root cause of me not being in business? Well, what's one of the root causes? I don't have clients. I go through this all the time with clients. Um, I say, what's, what's your major root cause? I don't have a website. No. <laughs> a website is a digitally glorified business card. And most people spend way too much time on that instead of going and saying, hey, I put in edible landscapes. I'd like to put in yours. That's the conversation that needs to happen. So within this, this becomes a system or a process by which we can create and filter questions. And as I was being taught holistic management by a buddy of mine years ago, I was like, it needs more stickmen. Like I need to understand how this works. So once I realized that the inventory and the values is us, and I realized that of course it's me because I'm wearing boots all the time. I could then take any sort of decision and action and I could use it to go through the testing questions. And sometimes that very first one root, root cause just tosses it away. Sometimes as we went through the different testing questions, we'd have to go all the way down to the end to again, realize that eh, also not the case. And then sometimes those, those, those answers come to us and they're true because we've actually evaluated them. So a longtime colleague, longtime friend of mine, Zach Weiss of Elemental Ecosystems and also Water Stories, the premier prodigy of Sepp Holter, reached out one day and was like, hey man, I got a big problem and I need some help. And through almost just like 20 minutes, 15 minutes, we evaluated his conversation so that way he could know, oh, wait a second, what I want to be true in the future and my current issues are not solved by this very shiny thing of a $15,000 business investment that was very shiny and very, you know, there's a lot of value to it, except for the fact that it wasn't for Zach at that time. It might be for him now, but it wasn't at the time. Similarly, a colleague and former student of mine, Dakota Cohen, who called my version of holistic management the most intelligent version he's ever seen of Cohen Family Farms, he had this opportunity to potentially buy back this original piece of land that they had to let go. But he would be facilitating half a million dollars of debt for the rest of his life. And so the sentimentality that we have can sometimes overrun the logic. And both are necessary. You know, the, the logical linear lubricates the emotions. The emotions lubricates the logic and linear. We are not a single trick pony. Our bodies are not just to walk around our brains to make logical decisions. We are a multi-factored fa individual. So Dakota also had this ability. And when we apply it to ourselves, we have this inventory, a holistic context, or our values and our zones of brilliance. And this then creates a sort of permeable cell that we can then uh, create and, and make decisions off of. And this then can build a number of different income generation sources, both online, in person, 
product, service. These are all the things currently that make up my income watershed. These are all the things that I do on a small and large scale basis that I enjoy, that I love. The red things are things I no longer do. The orange things are things that are on pause because I'm, I, I've am i moved and I'm transitioning to build more uh, local content. But this then creates a tessellated pattern that we can then take different types of things we like because we're multifaceted and we can build out this entire conversation. So that takes care of the first three. That takes care of start where you are, eligibility, clarified value. So the next thing we do is we inventory. And my approach with clients is very simple. We do what's called a decum chart, developing a curriculum. This means that if you're starting off as a soil food web consultant, if you want to become a community designer, if you want to become a values-based decision maker, we basically take a look at all the skills you need to have and we detail them out. And then we give them a competency. What's the competency you have currently and what's the value or what's the priority of each of these? And then it becomes a hit list. Then we go out and we get the skills you need to build your business. And again, going back, earn or learn. Next, we take a look at craft, reputation, and systems. And these are the three pillars. These are the things that are most important. So craft is that systematically, consistently smiling, developing skills. Reputation is telling people what it is you do, communicating simply. And systems are the business systems that allow us to transact business in a smooth way. This could not be more specific to me when I realized there's this old saying as, as a hammer, we'll go out and we'll hit everything thinking it's a nail which is true. If you just think you're one, you're one way of going at it and creating it, that'll be the case. But sometimes it's a reverse as well. You need to uniquely know who you are as a hammer to go and seek the nails that you're uniquely suited to nail down, to avoid the screws, to avoid the eye, eye screws, to avoid everything else that you don't do absolutely brilliant, and to realize that the skills we develop are forever. They stay with us however long we're with. So it's really about a, and being a craftsperson is going and finding the nails that you're uniquely suited and you enjoy working upon. The next thing is this idea of reputation. So uh, I, I once almost got kicked out of a natural building colloquium uh, because I was asked to speak and I said, I'm going to say something and no one's going to like it. And I said, if you're not willing to tell people you do natural building, don't be a natural builder. And there was a lot of great grumpy faces. And we had a lot of funny moments because they all said, well, how dare you? I said, well, how dare you? How dare you have a beautiful, brilliant skill and not tell people it's what you do? Natural builders are the worst for telling people what they do. And that's the crux of it. You need to be able to hang a shingle out and tell people, hey, this is what I do. And if you give them the story, the point of view, this idea that what I do has a value to it, it's what I'm doing, people come on with you because they, they believe in what you're doing. They believe that you bring them hope. And that's one of the things that permaculture does best. What I realized far too late in business, and this is one of my hardest won lessons, is that advertising is the price for being unremarkable. So if you're not worthy of remark, you got to go pay advertising costs. If you're worthy of remark, people are talking about you all the time. So it's very specific. And uh, Eric Olson, good colleague and friend of mine, did this when he started Permaculture Artisans. He developed the landscape design for his city town hall. He brought all of his guys together. He installed it. And that was two years of work off of that one design because he was worthy of remark. One of the things I help clients with is this idea of creating a niching statement. We work with these kinds of people struggling with these kinds of problems, we feel this way about their problems, helping them to get these results. What's great about this is very quickly, people know if they're for you or not. Everybody who comes to your business is a yes, a maybe, or no. They're already that before they look at your content. Your job is to show your content to be as transparent as possible. So that way, who you are is expressed on the page. It's exactly what you don't do in dating apps. Dating apps, you make up this faux person. People then try to have a date with you. They realize you're not the person. They get frustrated. In business, it's about making it as transparent as possible. What, another client I worked with was an incredible gentleman who did uh, hoard wood. He just did firewood. And when he realized that he provided households who were frustrated with finding reliable wood, dried, split, full cord, larch, those three things made him very popular and very profitable because he realized the one thing that everybody was looking for, dried, split. They wanted a full cord. They didn't want to be cheated out of that. They wanted it split so it fit in and they wanted it dry. He did that. He could charge more. He did. He made a brilliant business. Back to Chris. I help artists, musicians, and other creative project makers design, balance, sustainable careers. Very clear. You know if you're for Chris or you're not for Chris. This was another one of my many iterations when I had a little bit more hair, eat shoots and leaves. It was a microgreens company that we grew and then bicycled around Victoria. 
But here again, it was very easy. We needed to have a very simple statement. So that way we could tell our grocers, we could tell our restaurant uh, clients who we were, what we did. And it made our, it made our business. It made people go, I know what you are and I'm excited what you do. And so this is my approach when I do land design. And this is my approach when I do life design. I help ecologically aware entrepreneurs who are stalled, stuck, or staying negative, create an and, and enact a ruthless clarity of vision to live a profitable, right livelihood. And that's my business statement for a regenerative business design when I help people with their businesses. So again, these kinds of people, these kinds of problems, this way of thinking. And if you can do this, if you can encapsulate your business, chances are you can, can communicate it very easily with people. And then lastly, systems. So this goes into how are we accurately working with our uh, bookkeeping? What does the systems online look like? How do people interact with this? And just making sure that they're smooth and simple. If somebody had told me years ago, I should go with an out of the box uh, web designer instead of doing it custom, I would have paid that person $500 because I would have saved 10X that. So it's understanding those systems. This is something we do with our regenerative business design uh, courses and, and mentorships is we help people to take simple, simple, cheap steps and then build upon that in terms of the value. The next, this idea of value expert advice. So when we started Eat, Shoots and Leaves, we reached out to Chris Thoreau of the food peddlers in Vancouver who had developed uh, microgreens business systems, had done it for years. We paid him close to $2,000 at the time, which was more money than we had. And he set up the entire business for us. All we had to do was do the work. Everything was done. This is why I have no problem wherever I go in paying for expert advice. If you get free advice, you usually pay the price of that free. And so it's really important that when I'm starting a new business, I go to whoever's the best. I pay whatever they want to understand exactly what it is they're looking for so I can get what I need. To that end, when uh, COVID hit, I realized that so many people were polarized and were polarizing more. I wanted an educational platform that wasn't based on an ism or an ology. So People were getting excited about permaculture. People were getting excited about uh, biodynamic farming. I just wanted something that was simple, you know, the practical skills to live on the planet as if we intend to stay. I wanted a place where if I got out of my PDC, I could go and take all the advanced courses I needed. And that's how regenerative living came to be. I needed to create a professional, professional design school so that way people can go and have their advanced conversations. And that's what regenerative living has become. <music> Document everything, anything in the world, document, it. make a conversation. I was lucky because somebody told me this at the beginning. So my uh, CV has every single course I ever taught, every single project I ever did. Plus my website is now a repository of all of these portfolio pieces. And when I ask clients, why'd you choose me? They say, we saw that you do what we want. We saw it with our own eyes. And this is one of the most important things I tell clients when we're starting you have to take photos. The most important thing you could do is get a project on the ground and take before and after photos. Most important thing. Everything else is secondary. I've had previous clients, pardon me, students who came out of the OSU PDC and within two months had a design business because they said, hey, mom, hey, dad, I want to put something in the ground. They did. They got photos. They put those photos on social media. That's all they did. They still didn't have a website and they had a project because they showed people what they did. Here's what we do. And somebody goes, oh, that's what I want. Remember, everybody's a yes, maybe or no. They were able to have it right away. So part of this is also sharing to know your message and share your message. The marketing you do is the marketing that works. Should I do YouTube? Should I do podcast? Doesn't matter. What can you do consistently? Don't ask what we should do. Ask what you will do. I love podcasting. I love talking. I can talk apparently quite fast. I have no problem with this. People come to me still for the podcast I did with Diego Footer on Permaculture Voices and the last ones, maybe six years ago, I'm still getting work off of that because I love doing that. Also be conscientious about long tail, perennial advertising, things that stay up forever. The great thing about YouTube, the great thing about social media, the great thing about podcasts is people can interview you ad nauseum. I have clients who come to me and said, I listened to you for probably 15 hours before I'm having this phone call. It's very weird because it feels like I know you. Fantastic. I didn't pay for that at all. They interviewed me. They didn't take any, uh, any of my time. One of the things I do is I help clients to develop and create their online social media. And so th these are some great examples of a former uh, 
a student of mine turned colleague, and then also a client of mine that were actively developing their social media and making sure that they're posting and telling the story of the world they want to see. People need to realize that social media is your version. It's your storytelling. It's you, it's you basically writing in your journal at night saying, oh, I love this. This was so cool. That's the point of advertising and telling that that point of view. And then the last thing is monitoring and adapting. So working with your business as much as possible, making sure that you have firm beliefs, but they're loosely held. They're light. I've had to adapt and pivot my business multiple times to the point to where now my base advice to everybody is have four different types of business processes that come through two different channels. One's in person and one's online. Have a product and a service you do in person, have a product and service that you provide online. COVID and the rather tumultuous times we live in has shown us that we need to have multiple streams of income to consistently be viable. So having those four elements is where I think everybody should be working towards. Jesse, eight minutes to spare. I feel like we we accomplished something. <laughs> I wish you could have put in some value though, Javin. I mean, geez. I'll try next time. I'll try next time. Man. It's just, I, my problem is, is that uh, I just like the surface. I don't like. Yeah. You deep. just skim across and give people fluff. That's not really actionable. No, man, that was, that was amazing. Um, Can you just repeat what were those four things online in person? And there were two. Things. Yeah. So I think at this point, because of where we're at and what's going on, everyone should have an online and everyone should have an in-person business present. And it can be the same topic. It can be the same niche, the specialization. Online, you should have a service and a product. So a digital product, a digital service. And in person, you should have a person, uh, a tangible product. That could be a food product. I did tinctures for the last five years because I love doing it. Yep. It was an amazing little supplementation to my income. And I only made the three tinctures I like to make because I use them. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's that question when you become a permaculturalist and people know you and then the local gardening club hires you to come and talk or asks you to come and talk. People say, what should we grow? And you're like, what are you talking about? You grow what you like, you grow what you love, you grow what you eat. And, and that's also from a design perspective for clients who are part of, for, for students who are becoming business design clients, uh, you start dating plants, right? You become enamored with a plant, you learn about it and that helps you to grow what, can become the encyclopedic knowledge of many permaculturists who've been in this world for 20, 30, 40 years, that when you're starting is very intimidating. It's one of the most intimidating things. I had an amazing instructor who was encyclopedic. He worked at the Bullock Brothers. He knew the Latin, he knew the common, he knew when to grow it. He knew its, he, he knew its uh, genetic tree in terms of how it was created. And it was the most like it was emasculating at a certain point. It was just like, I'm never going to learn that. I'm, I'm a terrible human. I'm not a person. And yet when I realized that the way he got to that knowledge was pretty traumatic and how he developed that was out of necessity because he wasn't eating. Uh, he was homeless. He needed to create gardens. He needed to build his knowledge. I realized that if I just take a, a plant a year and date it and just be, like, fall in love with it and cultivate it and understand it, then I would pretty quickly get to one plant within six months or three months, and then I could do another. And so every year was like three, four plants, but you build the skill of adapting and identification. And now you have 10, 20, 30, 100, 200, 300 plants that you can identify and work with. So it's all about, again, going back, systematically, smilingly, consistently developing skill, and then basing that on what you love. Yeah, totally. And and that with the in-person product or service that, you know, as you learn those plants, you could be selling those two or three plants as you learn them and then grow that over, over time. I mean, there's so much to double tap on and go into. We just don't have the time as you know, Javin, but this was really amazing. This is super, um, I would say super high level, know thyself information, which then leads to sort of like you say, like businesses that can't sort of fail because you've done the self inventory, you've done the inventory of the problems space that you're trying to solve within. And man, you can't, you can't sort of go wrong. Now, one of the areas that I'm a big fan of as well is mentorship and actually paying somebody for the exact piece of information you need and the exact actionable way that you need it. So uh, I'm assuming you're taking clients. How would people maybe be able to work with you? What's your preferred method? What type of client do you want to work with? That sort of thing. Yeah. So typically I take somewhere between a dozen to two dozen clients every single year who are in a business mentorship conversation. So clients that are transitioning out of a business, 
they're trying to transition into a permaculture or regenerative or an ecologically based business or students out of a PDC. Mm -hmm. Typically, I've been working one-on-one -on -one with folks and they can just reach out allpointsdesign.ca, send me an email, javin at allpointsdesign.ca. Hey, I heard you here. I'd like to talk to you. We do a good fit call. I'm always fit over finance. Yeah. Finance, you know, it just doesn't register anymore. I want to enjoy the work. So I evaluate my clients to see potential clients to see if they should be good clients. And then usually we work uh, between one and three years. That's the average uh, okay. average time I work with a client some clients I'm still working with today 10 years later which is awesome yeah. other clients they just need a little help so that's the way to do one-on-one -on -one. this year I'm going to be offering a regenerative mentorship design uh, regenerative business design mentorship process mm. for uh for probably a small group a cohort of about 12 maybe 18 uh, going to be starting March, April. And basically if, if you're interested in that, definitely sign up to the newsletter at allpointsdesign.ca. It's at the bottom and um, there'll be more information coming out. Also, if you're interested in any of those high level courses with regenerative living, uh, check out regenerative living. Basically what and how we run is we do live courses. The live courses become recorded courses and then you can be, you can be part or you can take part in those courses. Mm. To, today, we start a brand new course called aesthetics for ecological landscapes because so many people make ugly edible landscapes and uh this gentleman jamie wallace is an award-winning edible landscape designer but also an award-winning ornamental landscape designer so he's sharing what he knows for the next uh six weeks we have another gentleman keelan gell of off-grid gas who will be giving the absolute penultimate masterclass on biogas digesters mm. we have another gentleman most people know him mark lakeman we're going to be doing uh, what does permaculture look like in the cities when you're working with municipalities? So we have the best instructors who are coming with regenerative living. And then we have our entire host of previous courses, family food security. If you ever wanted to know exactly how much food your family need to eat and how to go about creating it, great course. Composting toilets, fantastic course. The best rainwater harvesting course I have ever been part of, and I took the ARCSA course, is Gord Baird's uh, Remote Harvesting Design and Implementation. You know, we've got this suite of courses that if you want to specialize in a place, Hedgerows with Jude Hobbs. If you want to specialize in a specific type of design or a specific type of offering, it's a great place to go and learn. That's perfect. All right, final word to you, my friend. What would you say to folks listening to the summit just by way of closing? Uh, if you don't design your life, it'll be designed for you. Be conscientious that you can always design. It's always a good time to design. And... Uh, Life's 100% negotiable. Negotiate the best life you can.